pretty little analog things. A few weeks ago, I bought a new keyboard to go with my iPad so that I can take it when I go out to coffee shops and add words to screen. It's a great keyboard, but because it's designed for the Spanish language with all the different accentation and reversing of question marks at the beginning and end of questions, and all the little extra differences, it took me a while to get used to it. Not wanting to ask for help, not wanting to read the very detailed instructions, I struggled to use it for the first two coffees worth of attempt until I went and watched some YouTube videos and now I have a very good keyboard that I can use happily and successfully with my iPad. I didn't grow up with digital technology. I had to adapt to it in my 40s and I'm still learning and the adventure is great. I'm enjoying the YouTube journey. I've just started writing on Medium, the weekly newsletter that I send out all of that is me attempting to get to grips with things that I know are helpful, processes that I think can help our small little business here at home, but also which require me to learn new things all the time. And in thinking about the keyboard example, I've come back to the idea of pretty little analog things. I made some notes in my current Laker notebook. It's an A6 that I use in my folding bag that I've shown you in another video. And in this one, I've talked about some ideas for a video based on non-technical, analog, physical items that I find useful. And looking at that, I'm going to talk about some things that I use on a very regular basis, but which for me make my life simpler. A lot of people talk about the use of software to make your life easier, more productive. But I am still very much pen and paper and using analog systems to help me. It's in my notebook that I'm adding the ideas for my Medium articles for this coming week. At the moment, I'm working on the idea of three or four articles a week from now until the end of April. And then I'll be able to look back and think, OK, I've got 18 or 20 articles how has my first month on Medium been and what did I learn from that? Perhaps that will be another video process that I can share here on the channel. So let's talk about some things that I use on a very regular basis, some of them daily, others weekly. But they are things that I go back to because I know they're useful, I am comfortable with using them and working with them, and I get the results that I want using these little tools or items that support my work as a writer. In no particular order, this is one of my wallets. I bought it in 2008 in the local charity shop in Nottinghamshire, in the village where I grew up, and I love it for various reasons. The first is that the outer fold resembles a QWERTY keyboard, but inside it has a lovely silk effect lining and then on the bottom of this little card pocket, it says, All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. How many times did we hear that in our childhood from a grandparent or a well-meaning aunt or uncle? The idea that we would do our studies, do our schoolwork, but there was more to life than that. And we had to get out and play in the village, in the green lanes, in the forest, at the back of the village, and just enjoy ourselves as kids. So I like this because I bought it in the village where I grew up. My mum was a big charity shop fan and although this was new and in its packaging, I still bought it at the charity shop and it just cost me five pounds. One of the things that I always carry in my wallet is this beautiful Victorinox card. It's only the size of a credit card in shape, slightly thicker if you look at it, but it's a magical piece of kit. It's got the necessary knife, which I guess we would use for peeling apples or slicing open an orange. Sometimes it's very useful for opening a package that's been delivered by Mercado Libre or Amazon to the house. Of course, it's got a nail file, a pair of tweezers, a handy little toothpick. And for heaven's sake, who would ever need one of these? But it contains a nail that you can use to pierce a wall. Strange, but very true. 
And one of the most useful things in it is this little pull-out pair of scissors. I was given this by my then mother-in-law in December of 1994. So it was a Christmas present that I've had 30 years and which still gets a daily outing in my wallet because it's so immensely useful. In 1981, I worked on a summer camp in the Catskill Mountains with two specific one month groups of adolescent kids from New York City Centre who had come, each of them, on a one month vacation up into the mountains. Afterwards, I hitchhiked from upstate New York down the Appalachian Mountains and over to San Francisco to stay with some friends of my parents, a couple called Bob and Marge, who will become relevant when I show you another item here. But on the way across Texas, before I got to California, I went into a little department store and I bought my first ever Schaefer pen. I don't think this cost me $5 in the department store. And the only ink they had, I remember it very well, was a box of brown cartridges. It's a really functional little pen. It's very strong. If I've had it since 1981, that means I've been a proud user of this for 43 years. It's a great pen. It writes really well. The notes I made this morning were with this Schaefer pen on the ideas of things I would put into a little video about analog things that I love. But for a pen that's 43 years old and only cost me $5, I reckon I did really well walking into that department store. I had a week in El Paso with an American writer called Carlos Castaneda, who that's another story altogether. But he wrote some amazing books based on Mexican anthropology. And this pen I bought in a department store when I was out shopping with him. If you've seen some of my videos, you know that I often use a cross biro that I was gifted as a 13 year old boy by my aunt and uncle. When I was in El Paso with Carlos and I went into a department store and bought my Schaefer and those famous brown ink cartridges, I also bought my first ever high value propelling pencil. But there was some kind of stock clearance sale in that little department store in El Paso. And so I bought this beautiful propelling pencil for a small amount, probably a lot for me then as a traveling student, maybe it was 10 or 15 dollars, I can't remember. Beautiful things cost a little bit of money when you buy them, but if you look after them, they are a legacy for the rest of your life. You get to enjoy them on a regular basis as part of your everyday carry, as part of the things that you love and which are important to you in your art or your profession. So look after them. Where was I heading that summer hitchhiking across the States? If you remember, I was going to San Francisco and I was going to stay with some friends of my mum and dad called Bob and Marge. I remember my parents meeting them when I was about 16 years old. They had come to England on a holiday visiting places in rural England and my parents and they happened to be staying in the same bed and breakfast. These two couples, my mum and dad and Bob and Marge, struck up a friendship that lasted until their deaths. So it was natural for me, not knowing anybody in San Francisco, to send a letter to them from upstate New York before setting off and saying, I'm going to be hitchhiking across the States. Please, can I come and stay with you? And I had the best time. I traveled with several friends, not together. Some went by bus, others by car. I hitchhiked and all of us arrived at this lovely bungalow in a place called Mountain View, which is now very much part of the Silicon Valley community. That was in 1981. In 1983, I was living in southern Mexico and I had decided to walk across the country. And I must have mentioned it to Bob and Marge in a letter to them, because one day in the post, this arrived. It's an engineer's compass. It's solid brass. It has a pocket loop to go on a belt or perhaps to attach to a bag. It has the protective cover and here you've got the wire piece in the sighting cover and then here you have a piece of glass so I look through that I line it up with the sighting line and I can see the exact destination or the journey that I'm going to make showing on the compass I've had this since 1983 it was useful on two occasions in the jungle when I got lost and without this I would not have survived I would not have got out but now I regularly use it, basically using a diagonal line through the bookshelf behind me 
If I were to follow a line of 67.7 degrees east northeast, that goes straight back to England. So although I'm thousands of miles away from where I grew up, that compass just reminds me where two of our sons are and where part of our home life lies. Something as simple as this, which arrived in the post 41 years ago as a gift from a friend of my parents, who also sent me a bunch of clandestine maps, which perhaps shouldn't have been released outside of the United States. But thank you, Bob, you know how much that meant to me all those years ago. The other item I want to share with you in this little look at analog things that I use on a regular basis is what's peeping out of my wrist bag. This is a Seiko 5 watch. From the case back markings and the numbers stamped into the case, I can see that this was made in Japan for the local domestic market in September of 1968. I was five years old at the time. I found this piece on DC Vintage Washers years ago, and I bought it from Nick, another Nick there. And I love it. It comes on a little racing leather strap, which is not the original strap, but the internal movement is exactly the same as it was when it left the factory in 1968. This, of all the items I'm talking about today, is perhaps the most analogue and also the most used. Put me in my happy place and you'll find me outside a coffee shop with my wrist bag, with a fresh cup of coffee, a watch, a pen and a notebook to work on. That's my approach to the analogue life. These are all things which I use on a regular basis, but they have history, they have a meaning and they have some kind of story for me which when I uncap this pen and I write in my notebook I still remember buying it in the store in 1981 in El Paso. When I was a five-year-old boy at primary school I didn't have a watch. I didn't have a watch until I was 10 years old. So this is very nostalgic for me, very representative of my childhood growing up in a village and I put this watch on and I am connected to my past and to the people from that village, the writers, the craftspeople, the farmers, the churchmen. So many wonderful aspects of my childhood are represented by this watch. And the fact that you can buy a vintage watch and look at the detail on the case back and know about its history, that's quite amazing. When I feel I have to use technology, I use it. Like I've said, it's allowing me to publish YouTube videos to create article content and stories on the Medium platform. I like to think on paper. I like to mull through ideas and potential topics that I might be talking about or writing about. And using something as simple as this beautiful Schaefer pen that has such a history for me to capture ideas, to put those into one of my notebooks and to move forward with the things that are part of my daily life using analog tools and instruments. What do you use? What are you attracted to? Is there a watch or a fountain pen or a wrist bag that you're attracted to? Are you committed to a certain type of notebook or journal product for capturing your ideas and thinking about your goals and your plans and the way you will get closer to those using the pen and the paper approach? I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope there's been something in it that you can find useful and attractive. If there isn't, tell me. But if there is, tell me in more detail and tell me why using physical, analog, non-digital approaches to leading your daily life are helpful to you and how they benefit you. Thank you for watching.